Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of DABCC TV. As always, we have a great episode for you today, and I'm really excited about this one because we have the App DNA guys on, and they're going to show us the apti their aptitude solution. And this is one of the cooler solutions out there. In fact, I was telling a friend about it a few days ago, and he's like, oh, man, I saw that at Synergy, and that was the coolest thing I saw there. So uh, I'm really, really excited to see it and really excited to show it to you guys, too. So with no further ado, let's just dive straight into it. Uh, we have we have Smeet Patel with us, and, and uh, well, let's just dive into it. Smeet, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Doug, it's always a pleasure to be on. I um, appreciate the opportunity. Uh, so yeah, my name is Sumit Patel. I'm the VP of uh, Technology and Solutions Group over here at AppDNA. Um, and it's my pleasure to actually uh, get a chance to get in front of everyone and uh, go through the aptitude overview and maybe even get into a little bit of a deep dive with the demonstration itself. And Doug, as you mentioned, you know, one of the things that's been really great for us um, coming out of the Synergy Show is we had the opportunity to actually go in there and enter the Process Improvement Award, and we actually ended up winning that and taking home Best in Show. Um, so we did make quite a splash, and I'm very excited to uh, to kind of continue that momentum moving forward here. That's awesome. That's awesome. Best of Show. So, uh, yeah, I'm really excited to see this. I have not seen it yet. I've, you know, we've talked about it. Uh, I've looked at some pictures. I've read some of the guides, you know, things like that, but I've not actually seen it in action. So uh, let's get to it. Sound good? Yeah, sounds good. So um, just for those that haven't gotten a chance to actually uh, listen to Doug's fabulous podcast uh, a little bit earlier, um, you know, just to do a little bit of baseline level setting, uh, AppDNA really focuses on uh, removing a lot of the blockers associated with desktop migration projects, uh, focusing on application compatibility. Um, and the reality of it is, is that Regardless of how organizations, what their corporate strategy looks like uh, moving forward, uh, it is a diverse and it is a changing computing landscape. And the, what we're looking at is we're looking at people that are like now looking to move to something like Windows 7, but at the same time explore a lot of the other uh, ways to deliver their desktops to their end users, um, whether it's using something like Zen App Streaming, whether it's some permutation of VDI where they decide, you know what, I'm going to use a, you know, a client level hypervisor. I'm going to stream an entire virtual desktop down to any device, any time. Um, the one thing that really remains constant in all of that is that applications are still going to be a business critical uh, piece that's going to allow those end users to remain productive. Doesn't matter how they get onto the desktops or how they're delivered. Uh, the point is they're still going to be around. Um, so regardless of how, you know, what, what that desktop computing strategy looks like, what we focused on doing is we focused on ensuring that organizations understand how their applications will play in those different delivery models. And Aptitude has really been the platform that allows us to say, you know what, the old school way of doing things was let's set up a lab environment, bring my experts in, bring my application owners in. I'm going to click through this over the next 15 days see what works, see what doesn't, see if it'll work in a virtual instance, is it conducive for multi-user mode. It's all different types of testing that people were following via scripts and then coming up with the result. The problem is that wouldn't really scale when you're dealing with 100, 500, 5,000 applications. So we've taken the approach of let's understand the DNA, hence, application, hence app DNA. Let's understand what the construct of this application looks like from the actual installation media itself, so from the source, and then statically help you determine how to best deliver this application in your desired environment. And what you're looking at here on the screen now is you're looking at the, the UI. It is a uh, client-server-based application, and really the UI here is going to kind of be the control panel, the dashboard of, um, uh, of aptitude to help you make some of those decisions. Uh, so what we can get into is we have different modules, and we'll get into this a little bit later in the demonstration, but the idea here is to be able to step in and at a glance understand where your por uh, application portfolio as a whole fits today. So if I'm looking at different technologies for delivery, so let's say, you know, the optimized desktop, I'm looking at 64-bit, Windows 7, a touch of AppV, I'm able to discern at a high level right off the bat which of my applications will work in that type of environment versus those that I might have to say, you know what, I want to use the old school, um, you know, I want to use the, the presentation layer streaming 
uh, with the new Zen app 6, which is going to be running on a server 2008 R2 environment. Well, side by side, I'm able to see all that information at a very high level. Now, are you able to see the screen okay here, Doug? You bet I can. Uh, you bet I can. I do have one quick question for you, uh, and I love it when people show off these demos and they, you know, this is full of a bunch of information. What did it take to get to this point? You that's know, a, that's a great question, actually, and uh, that's that's some of the that that's really part of the beauty of the overall App DNA platform, the App to Two platform. Um, what we're actually looking at right now is we're looking at we're looking at information that we were able to produce statically by looking at the source media alone. And what that means is that's just a way of saying that give us your MSIs, give us your installation. If you have a definitive software library or you have some file, map file share somewhere that houses all of your installation media, all you have to do is you point aptitude at it regardless of the format. And aptitude is able to go ahead, um, recursively go through that entire application portfolio, find your installation media, and consume it to generate these reports. So it's literally minutes per application without ever exercising the application. Well, very cool. And you also mentioned this is a client server app. So is, it, is that correct? Did I understand that correctly? Yeah, that is correct. So we do actually house the Aptitude platform on an application server. Um, all of the application DNA and the metadata around that application is housed in a database. Uh, and then there's a client interface that's going to allow you to connect to that server. So you have multiple clients that are able to use Aptitude simultaneously. So it scales to the enterprise class where you have 80 or, fi uh, 80 or 500 application owners uh, coming in and trying to get reports around their application portfolios. Very cool, very cool. So in the, at the end of the day, if someone downloads this today as, a, as an eval, and we'll get to all that you know, later where, where they go to learn more, but what do they do in sort of a you know, one-minute explanation to get set up to get to the point we're at right now? So the one-minute explanation is um, all you have to do if you have a SQL farm or all you have to do is create an instance, uh, set up your app server. Uh, it's a next, next, next finish, very straightforward installation on the application layer as well as the client layer. Um, and what we're able to go ahead and do at that point is you can go through the import process um, and you just go ahead, pick your applications that you're looking to import, and it's very straightforward. So if you know where all your binaries are, go through and you can actually create an import list just like this uh, with all of your information about your file names and their locations or just the locations and we'll do the recursive search. Um, or if you're, not, if you're not comfortable using the CSV, we still have a search functionality that says find all my MSIs or all my non-MSIs up on this particular location. Click search and we're able to consume all of those immediately. Very cool. Very cool. So it's a fairly straightforward process as far as importing the applications go. And then the important thing is once we get that metadata and that application DNA into the database, we're able to run analyses at different times. So if, for instance, your first thing is, I want to physically install this application in a Windows 7 environment, you can run against our Windows 7 algorithms. Um, and then, let's say, six months down the line, you decide, well, I also want to roll out something like Zen App Streaming or App V or some layer, level of application virtualization. You revisit that same application DNA. There's not a multiple important testing process you already have the information about that application, just run it against another set of heuristics, and now you have a more complete view of how this application is best delivered. Very cool. Very cool. Okay, what's next? So, um, like I said, we go into the overview summary here. Uh, what we're able to see off the bat is I'm able to see how to best deliver some of these applications. So let's take a look at some of the more complex applications uh, in my environment. And what I'm able to see uh, right off the bat is I'm able to see, all right, let's take a look at something like my BBC ticker application, where this is not something that's terribly important to my organization in general, but I still want to follow best practices as a managed application. Well, I'm able to see off the bat that if I'm running, you know, if I have a different idea of how I can deliver these applications, whether it's Zen app hosted or whether it's in an app v format or physical installation, from here, off the bat, I'm able to discern that I can run this in a 64-bit environment. I could run it in Windows 7 as a physical package. It'll run in Server 2008 R2. But if I'm taking the path of least resistance, 
I'm going to run it in a Windows 7 environment because if I wanted to deploy this as a Zen app hosted package, I might have to do some additional testing. Um, if I want to do it as an app feed package, same story. So the information is provided up front so that you can make the decision on how to deliver each and every single application. And how, again, is it uh, going to, you know, deciphering that? How, how does it figure out that it's green or amber? So that's a great question. What we have is we have different modules, and each module has its own set of heuristics. Um, so when I say heuristics, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about algorithms that we have in place um, that are able to take that metadata and that application DNA that we pull out. And when we pull out this DNA, one thing I'd like to call it is we're not just pulling out information about the installation itself, even though we are looking at the installation source media. What we're doing is we're going above and beyond just the MSI um, or just the installation package. We're actually getting beyond the files and registry. We're getting into the portable executables. We're getting into the binaries themselves. So we're not only just understanding how it's going to install in this environment, but also how it's going to function in that environment as well all done statically because of the fact that we understand that in this binary, it's meant to execute this ActiveX control, repair ActiveX function uh, once a week. We're able to figure that out without ever exercising the app. And the only way you would figure that out through manual testing is if you ran it for an entire week. Um, so once we actually get all this metadata, we're pulling out about 68,000 data points wow. uh, for an average application. And then we're running it against our, our algorithm sets, and we'll actually take a little bit deeper look at what that looks like um, through this view here. So if I look at, let's say, uh, my Windows 7 compatibility report, what I'm able to see off the bat is of the 70 applications I have in my portfolio, this is typical of what we're seeing. It's not as daunting as people think, um, the migration, because typically I see between 55 and 65 percent of applications being green. The challenge for most organizations is understanding which 55 to 65 percent will be green, right? So we're giving you that information up front by saying, by taking a look at all the uh, information about this application and running it against the algorithm. So what exactly are we looking for? Well, here's exactly what we're looking for. I can actually come into every single application at a level view or I could actually go into my estate view. In my estate view, what I'm able to see is exactly what I'm checking for. So on the left-hand side under my rule group tab, I'm able to see the different categories of algorithms that I have in place. Um, the important thing to kind of call out here is we're not actually using hard-coded rules because if you try to use hard-coded rules and extrapolate that across an entire unique application portfolio, You'd probably dealing you'd probably be dealing with hundreds of thousands rule, uh, hundreds of thousands of rules. So what we're doing here is we're looking for intelligent and predictive analysis using algorithms. Where if you look at my deprecated components rule group, my algorithm set here, we're not just saying if there's a deprecated component, flag it and say that this might cause an issue for your application. What we're doing is tr we're trying to understand exactly what that deprecated component means to the functionality of that application. So I'm able to see that even while a majority of my applications, 77.7% .7 of them, are suffering from deprecated components, only five of those particular applications out of my 73 could potentially be broken. Interesting. Very, very cool. Where were you guys 10 years ago? You know, I get that question a lot. When people start talking about the pains of the XP migration, um, they talk about three years and tens of millions of dollars and thousands and hundreds of thousands of man hours. And you know what? If we were here 10 years ago, I'd probably be retired, to be honest. <laughs> oh, this is cool. So we can actually dig in and understand, I mean, what, what we're looking to do is we're looking to help organizations plan a migration path. And it's the planning that's happening right now in most organizations where people are saying, okay, well, we have a target deadline, end of life is coming up for XP, or we're looking at actually rolling out Zen App 6 by the end of December, uh, which would be very aggressive. But the point is there are targeted deadlines and people are starting to plan on what exactly this migration uh, path is going to look like. 
So what we want to do is we want to help you understand uh, not only what this migration path looks like, but also what we're going to be doing post that migration. So let's understand where your portfolio stands today and what it needs to do uh, to be effectively managed going forward. Um, so if I take a look at my overall application portfolio for my Windows 7 piece, I feel fairly confident that, you know what, 61%, that's not a bad starting point. Now, let's say I wanted to actually figure out where I could get to. This is the really nifty part, where we not only tell you what's wrong with your application, but also the severity of the defect, the level of effort associated, to, uh, associated with fixing it, and what the end state of that application could be. So if I look at my 61% off the bat, I'm able to see that if I follow the actions that are outlined by the aptitude platform, I'm able to see that I could potentially deploy almost 97% of my applications in a Windows 7 physical installation from the 61% I'm at now. Wow, that's cool. That is neat. Huh. So here, if I'm looking at an application, for instance, what I'm able to do is I'm able to say, all right, let's take a look at one of these applications I'm dealing with. Um, I'm able to see that with a little bit of TLC, I can get something like this Repelprob application, which was a red uh, before my, uh, during my initial analysis. After I fix my application using our forward path analysis, it's able to get to green. The level of effort associated with it is easy. Because you know what? We have two automated fixes that handle the entire thing. Wow. Click. Go ahead and click on that, uh, that, that hyperlink that you're sitting over now. Sure. So if I take a look at this REPLPROV application, what I'm able to see is I can actually drill into it. And I'm able to see exactly what's wrong with this particular application. So I see that there's, quite a, there's only four issues altogether. I scroll a little bit to the right here with the resolution, what you're able to see is initially I have issues with the, um, with the actual desktop compatibility manager. What exactly are those issues? Boom, here you go. Wow. Deprecated components are going to be green, but the real issue that's holding everything up is operating system versioning. What does that mean to me? It means a lot to me because I've played with applications for a while. But for someone that might not know, I can actually click in and I'm able to read the manifest that says there are launch conditions in this MSI that require a specific version of the OS. And that does not include, so it's that little version NT command that says that, you know what, this will not run in Windows 7 because it's only meant to launch in Windows 2000. So you see the version NT condition right now says it's equal to 500. If I wanted to fix it, I could go ahead and create a transform that changes the version NT to greater than 500 so that now it'll run on XP, Vista, and Windows 7. The other pieces are just deprecated components that are not actually affecting the functionality of the application, and now you'll be able to launch and install this application with a simple automated fix. Very, very cool. Huh. So, wow, I'm dumbfounded. This, <laughs> That's this always is a good thing. Yeah, this is very, very cool. So what else can it do? And not so, that that's um, not enough. Yeah, you know, some of the additional <laughs> things that we really focus on is, like I said, we're, we're looking at helping organizations try to figure out exactly how to plan their migration strategies. So what we have is, we have since we have all this information, I'm able to say that, all right, well, let's say I can change the operating system version. This isn't a great example. Let me jump into a different application something with a little bit more meat, a couple more errors. Uh, so what type of application is a nightmare to move from one platform to another? Uh, antivirus. So what I can do here is let me jump into my antivirus app. Let me go into my applications. Go. Go into my go into my actions actually really quick here because I want to show you the forward path again when I actually pick an app. Cool. So I'm going to go into a vast antivirus because I know that these applications are always 
someone's worst nightmare. Let me know if you see it here. What am I looking for? Uh, antivirus. antivirus. There we go. Arr. So we know that, the, the, that these applications don't usually migrate well, but we also know that they're not good candidates for virtualization. So let me see how I can actually move this application, because it is business critical. I can't leave my uh, desktops unsupported. I can't leave them unprotected. So if I actually go into my issue view here, I'm able to see that there are a couple of issues uh, with session zero isolation, but then there's one issue with UAC. So with user account control, what I'm able to find out is that there are executables that are actually being launched that need elevated privileges. Now this is something that we were able to discern with static analysis, even though it's a runtime issue. This is not something that has to do with the installation, but what I'm able to see is that there are forward paths for fixing it. This remediation piece is very key because of the fact that we're not just saying, oh, all you have to do to fix it is create an MSP. We're giving you many different options. So you can either run as admin here, you could either repackage it and then take that particular executable and run in elevated privileges mode, or if I look at this as a IT administrator, an application owner, I'm seeing that it's this, it's this updater service that's going to be running on a weekly basis. I found the exact file that's looking for those elevated privileges, and I can say, you know what? I'm not worried about the updater service because I, as an IT admin, am able to go ahead and send out my own virus package definition updates on a weekly basis. So I could just strip this out, and then I'm good to go. But let's say side by side, I want to see how this application would work in AppV. Well, all I have to do is click through my AppV tab, and sure enough, as we, as we would have guessed, this is not a good candidate for AppV because of the fact that there's a lot of reliance on machine level components. And as we know, applications that have deep hooks into the OS itself are not good candidates for app virtualization. Makes sense. So I'm able to get all this information just by quickly switching tabs. Very cool. I imagine you can probably print out some pretty amazing reports too? Yeah, we have the ability to actually do a couple of different types of exports, whether it's a PDF, whether it's an Excel spreadsheet, HTML. And for those uh, management reports, compiling the HTML always looks the best because there's pretty pie charts and uh, nice little pictures that people like to look at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, like I said, I mean, since we're able to get all this information about the application portfolio in general, um, it provides a lot of value in terms of helping you plan the, uh, plan the overall migration and then carry on with your day-to-day -day application churn. Uh, the really nice thing is we've actually tried to quantify exactly what level of effort is, it's going to take to help you with any type of migration. So if I take a look at my sample of portfolio, uh, my sample portfolio of applications here, which is 70 apps, I'm going to pull all of them in. Now, if I'm looking at different work streams, so let's say I want to actually see if it's going to work in a Zen App 6 environment, I'm able to create that report as well. Let's say I want to figure out how, how much effort it's going to take to move to Windows 7. 61% of my applications look like green now. Let's go ahead and figure this out. I've upped this to 94 apps. Now, the cool thing here is, here's what we were talking a little bit about earlier, where now we're able to say that, all right, here are the, the defects associated with your issues, so uh, associated with your application. So if I take a look at my Windows 7, a manifest will be ignored. Well, in order to fix that, there's going to be additional testing retired, uh, <laughs> required, and the level of effort associated with it is difficult. Unsigned MSIs, no remediation required. Straightforward, it's just a best practice validation. But let's say you want to follow best practices. You have the ability to come in and create your own action and go ahead and tie a level of effort associated with it. Wow. So we know and we understand every enterprise is unique and we know we don't have all the answers. So what we've done is we've created an effort calculator that's going to take every single unique enterprise's needs and try to account for them when we come up with an overall migration plan. Does that make sense? No. Well, <laughs> I, I won't claim to understand it 100%, uh, but it's it sure does make understanding it easy. You know what I mean by that? Yeah. yeah. I'm not an A. I, I used to be in, uh, 
I wouldn't say used to be an act application expert. I don't want to be that bold, right? But you know, that's uh, I'm this old Citrix guy. Uh, applications we had to understand them, right? And and as I'm sitting here listening and to and watching this, I'm thinking to myself, again, how nice this would have been. Uh, this is thoroughly amazing. Well, the idea is, I mean, even at that time, you know, ten years ago, when these uh, when these migration projects were were complex enough and and back in the old school CPS days when there was quite a bit of testing required to understand if an app would run in that type of multi-user environment, the reality is is that today is that same type of issue. I mean, we just called out two different instances from 10 years ago. Yeah. It's, it, today is that on crack, right? Yeah. Because now yeah. you have different permutations of VDI. You've got um, different ways to deliver your applications. You've got cloud-based. You have software as a service. Yep. You've got so many different ways to deliver these applications. But how should I start? How is it going to work? That's the questions that we're trying to answer. That is very cool. That is very cool. Well, we like to keep these podcasts right about 30 minutes. But uh, is there anything else you'd like to show? Yeah, so let me just actually step through the effort calculator very quickly here. So Please. based on the remediations that I've set up, everything that we have in the effort calculator is variable driven here. So now we're able to help you determine the complexity of the applications, um, you know, based on file and registry count. But the really cool thing is, so if you look here, we're going to have to cut that part out there, but um, I'm dealing with some old beta software here. But what we're looking at is we're looking at a way for us to actually come up with a migration plan to help you get from your 60% green to eventually your 97% green. Wow. Then also, I uh, for the guys out there watching them, I make him uh, uh, reduce the size. Uh, so I make uh, Smeet uh, reduce the size of the screen. So you know, if you have a any any modern laptop, you you won't see scroll bars. So that's my fault. No worries. So at a high level, I just wanted to kind of go through the overall decision making process. Um, you know, kind of talk you through what we're doing with application compatibility how it helps you make intelligent decisions around application delivery, and how we can actually help you uh, plan your overall migrations and then moving forward your business as usual process. This is very cool. So um, I, at this point, I can go ahead and turn it over to you, Doug. Okay, well, well that sounds great. I, I just have uh, one more question. That's a big question. Uh, somebody's been watching this, and they look, and they, they're they amazed and sort of dumbfounded as I am, and they say, well, I want to get my hands on this. Well, can they? Uh, can they? Is there an eval? Um, first question, is there any limitations on that eval, too, or do I actually get to really dive deep? Uh, so, and then, of um, course, we, where, we where to do, do that? We uh, actually support evaluations as well. You have to, If you wanted to go ahead and get an eval, you just have to go to our website, um, www.app-dna.com. Um, and on there, we have several different resources. You can go ahead and request an evaluation, and we'd have uh, a member of my team actually contact you and help you walk through the evaluation. There are no limitations aside from the license count, so you would be able to look just as deeply as I did into the overall um, application count. What's wrong with it? What are the issues? What do I need to do to fix it? What's my forward path look like? Uh, so you'd be able to get all of that information. We actually have, um, you know, if you're planning that migration, we have a couple of cool uh, utilities out there. We have an app migration workbook, which is just an ebook um, that's going to help you de determine what are the steps look like for a Windows 7 or a Zen app or a App V type of migration. We have a couple of white papers out there, uh, as well as a checklist around migrations to Windows 7. And we've got a bunch of cool reports up there that you can actually download. Pull those down. If you want any additional information about the, the demo or, or demo or pricing, uh, just go to info at app-dna.com. You can email that, and uh, we'll, we'd be able to get back to you. And you can actually, uh, we have a fishbowl.app-dna.com blog, which links back to dabcc.com quite a bit. So feel free to follow us up on the uh, technical blog. And then we're also on Twitter, which I don't actually understand how that works. But <laughs> we are at at DNA on Twitter. Well, Twitter, you know, I'm starting to understand it. Uh, I just have right. trouble keeping myself to 140 characters. Yeah, the, the thing is, I, I you know, I, people are talking about tweeting. I'm like, I don't understand what you can get out of 140 characters. But I think it's... Uh, 
it's definitely an interesting technology. To it's it's a way. great way in this, you know, to sort of bring this to to topic. It's a great way to stay up to up to date on things like what you guys are doing, right? So I can go tweet and say, hey, you know, we just did this great video with with you. Uh, check it out. The problem I have is when we we actually get into a discussion and you cannot discuss something in, in real intelligent way in 140 characters sure. and it starts becoming annoying when you're you sending three because I'll, I'll i'll get passionate about something and then it'll be three four five tweets in a row and that looks like spam or it looks annoying and then i get people complaining you know it's like well i actually want to tell you something <laughs> so uh, I use the link and then, you know, short little quick bits and, and then also to tweet about what other people are doing, too, or retweet, I guess. And that's sort of neat, too. Um, but otherwise, uh, you know, the, the real power of learning is listening to things like DABCC TV and DABCC radio uh, or in, in events li or in, in services like that. Right. Not just my stuff uh, where we can actually dive deeper. So guys out there listening, I hope you like these episodes that we put together. Uh, I love bringing guys like Samit on and have them show off the goods because this is really neat stuff that, you know, that the Samit is showing us. And then hopefully that, the, you know, the other vendors we have on to the other show and tells, so to speak speak so uh, on that note is there anything before we go ahead and call this an episode um, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today and I'll so, sort of give you the last word and if there's anything else you'd like to show us um, please have please have at it no I appreciate the time Doug as I said it's always a pleasure to, to be on and um, you know, I'm excited about the technology and if there are any questions out there feel free to come through any of the channels that I just outlined. Uh, we'd, be, we'd love to talk to you. Perfect, perfect. And then, guys, definitely check out the show notes, too, because we'll have the links to um, the different things, uh, you know, the over to the blog and their website to the eval and all that stuff. So if you forget where it is, just head over to dabcc.com forward, forward slash TV and uh, have at it. So, again, Smeet, thank you so much for your time today. 